Hello and welcome to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson. If this is your first time joining us, we want to welcome you. It's great to have you with us today. The Rising Generation exists to inspire and equip Christian leaders from all walks of life, from all around the world, to fulfill their God-given potential. By hearing these interviews with established, internationally recognized leaders, we hope you'll be inspired to connect the dots between where you are now and where it is God has called you to be. Now, to receive notifications about future episodes, simply subscribe to our podcast show by either on iTunes, if you're on Apple, or on Stitcher, the Stitcher app, if you're on Android. You can find out how to do that just by going to our webpage at www.errolawson.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please share it with your friends, share it with your loved ones. Hopefully, they will also benefit from the content. Guys, thanks for listening. Before we go into today's show, here's some news for you. Hey guys, how you doing? It's Errol here. Hope you're doing great today. Um, before we go into our interview today, I want to give you just a bit of a heads up on our Rising Generation campaign that started on the 1st of October. Now, if you're not aware already, um, we've been doing these interviews now. We've taken some of the nuggets from the, from the interviews and put them into a fantastic book, a resource called The Rising Generation, which is an amazing resource for emerging leaders, established leaders that will help you to step into your biggest challenges and become the leader that God has designed you to be. Now, the way the campaign works is this. Um, our goal is to get 1,000 pre-orders of the book between now and the end of October, and all the profits from the campaign are going to go towards our work in Africa, in Ghana. We're working with young people and giving them leadership training and soft skills training and even more. And and so for the last 15 years, I've been working as a leadership coach, a consultant, working in education and in business. You can check out my website for more information. Uh, I'm a John Maxwell trained coach, speaker and trainer. My appeal to you today is this. Uh, I want to offer my services to you, to your church, to your business, to your organization, to you as an individual in return for your support for this campaign. Let me give you an example of some of the packages that I'm offering to you. If you were to pre-order 150 copies of the Rising Generation book for your team, for your organization, for your church, or for your business, in return, I would offer you firstly a 90-minute live keynote address on a leadership topic of your choice, along with a Q&A for your organization or team. I'd also offer you a one-day leadership workshop for your team or organization, again, on a leadership topic of your choice. And also, in addition to that, give you a free half-day one-to-one or group coaching session, again, for yourself as a leader or for your core team or for your wider team on a leadership topic of your choice, all in return for your contribution, um, which is a $5,000 contribution. You're going to get $8,900 worth of value for your investment, and all the profit goes to the work in Ghana. How awesome is that? And there's a similar package. There's so many offers I've got. Another option is the $1,500 package, which for, for your $1,500 contribution, you'll get 20 copies of the book for your team or organization. And also a one-day leadership workshop with myself, again, for your team, your organization. I'll come in and train your team on a leadership topic of your choice. How amazing is that? So, so, so much value. And there are many more offers in line with your budget, what you're able to invest. I want to reach out to you guys. Go and check out the website to make this campaign a success. We really, really need your support. I'm banking on you. So please share this with your friends and help us to spread the word. We appreciate you. God bless you. Enjoy today's episode. Hello and welcome to the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast with me, Errol Lawson. And my special guest today is John Finkaldi. Hey, John, how you doing? Hey, Errol from Australia. Hey. Guys, John Finkeldy is the founder of Grow a Healthy Church. After pastoring for 30 years at C3 Church in Hepburn Heights, he now partners with pastors to grow healthy churches, ministering in Australia and internationally. He's been married for 38 years and has two married children and adults on his grandsons, Jack, Reese, and Archer. John has a master's in leadership and has authored five books. He loves shooting things with the camera, and in summer he can be seen thrashing around ineffectively in the surf at Scarborough Beach. Words that describe John: family guy, humorous, practical, insightful, loyal, loves the church, and is passionate. John, thank you again for being with us today. It's great to have you, man. 
So great to be with you, Errol, on this uh, beautiful spring day here in Perth, Australia. Magnificent touch of summer in the weather and uh, great to be with you on the podcast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, I've been listening to some of your videos and, and I've just checked out your website and really, really inspired by by the what's going to be happening in this conversation because I know you've got you got loads to give, especially to leaders who are who are leading churches, um, you know, in, in, in Australia and around the world. Um, but just first of all, fill in any gaps in your bio right there and give us a glimpse into what you're up to right now in the world. Yeah, look, um, over the years, uh, we've pastored in our church for 30 years. Um, I was a member of our church, became a youth pastor, associate pastor, and the lead pastor for 20 years. And five years ago, we launched Grow a Healthy Church. We finished pastoring our church. And it really came out of our passion that uh, Di and I, my wife and I have had over the years is seeing people develop and grow within their particular uh, gifting and their particular level of influence to, to help them find their right place and be released in their place. And so I think for us now at our stage of life, um, yeah, I'm really in my sweet spot of spending time with pastors and key church leaders to help them. Uh, do all that Christ wants them to do in their locality. Mm. So uh, for us, it's uh, we're right in the sweet spot of developing people mm. and helping build the church. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And um, I know you, you, your, work, your website is called Grow a Healthy Church. Um, maybe it's worth starting there, you know. Like, what is a healthy church? Great question. Uh, in my mind, I think pastors and leaders should focus on church health um, first and church growth eventually somewhere down the line. So if I'm looking at a church, if I want to do a quick snapshot of how healthy that church is, probably at a data level, at a numeric level, I'd look at the number of baptisms comparative to attendance. So I'm looking for about an 8% rate. So if there's 100 people attending on average on a Sunday morning, counting everybody who's there, including children, then healthy churches baptise around about eight, nine people uh, a year on that ratio of 100. Then I look at the percentage of people in a small group setting because a small group setting is where I think significant discipleship and relationships uh, are built, and then the number of people who are serving in the life of the church. So those three numerics give me a bit of a feel uh, for the health of the church. And then, of course, there's all the soft data, what I call soft data in terms of the relational aspects, the quality of relationships in the church, the level of conflict, how low that is, the kind of level of kindness, generosity and love that's in a church when you spend some time with the leadership. So I think those sort of, um, if you like, quantitative numerics, qualitative things harder to measure uh, give you an idea of the health of a church. It's great. It's great, John. And um, how did you know, I guess we're going back a little bit here, but how did you know at the beginning mm. of your journey uh, into ministry that this is what you were called to do above all the other things you could have been doing perhaps? Yeah, I think as a, I, I came to Christ when I was 19 and as a young Christian, I, I, I really from, um, you know, been a typical um, kind of manic 19 year old I wanted to change the world I think felt like I had a purpose in life so from my, I'd say from a young believers sort of stage I always had this desire to do something significant purposeful something that made a difference in people's lives and 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 as I followed that sense in my own heart I, I think Errol the it was the affirmation of key people in my life who said yep follow that there's something in that and I think along the way it was a sense of call within me that this is what Christ had for me and then key people in my life saying we can see leadership in you uh, we can see potential in you we can see where you can have an influence on others and, and I think it's that combination of what you have inside you being affirmed and encouraged by by key people in your world. You never want to strike out on your own. Mm. I think it's better to be sent than to just go by yourself. So mm. I always look for that affirmation from others. Mm. It's great. It's great. And um, was there like a, a turning point for you? Maybe I'm sure there are several. Um, maybe a point where yeah. you were kind of going in one direction and something happened, a revelation, an epiphany, a turning point that caused mm. you to go in a completely different direction in your journey. Can you tell us that story? I, I 
Yeah, look, I, I think probably 20, just over 20 years ago, I, I went to Sydney. Um, we live in Perth, west coast of Australia. Sydney's a good four or five hour plane ride the other side of Australia. And I, I went to a conference over there. <clears throat> While I was there, I visited two churches, um, C3 Church, Oxford Falls, uh, the leader of our movement, Dr. Phil Pringle. I visited his church and I visited the now famous Hillsong Church and went to the Hillsong Conference. And probably visiting those two large churches in Sydney, um, Sydney's a far bigger city than Perth, uh, being in a bigger environment around bigger leaders, uh, that transformed my leadership life. I'd already was a pastor, I was leading our church, but I came back from that week away of conference and two significant churches in our nation, deeply impacted with, I would say, a, a spirit of faith, a gift of faith, and with a realization that for our church to uh, really influence and impact our community, we had to be relevant, we had to be real, we had to get beyond being religious and just a church, we had to energize uh, that whole community connection into the surrounding suburbs of our church. I, I think that was probably one of the big turning points in my uh, Christian leadership life when I realized that, you know what, I had to change, change in various manners of speaking uh, to make sure my speaking was relevant to non-Christians and also in my dress, in my demeanor and in my world of relating to non-Christians because as a pastor, it's easy to be almost monastic in your lifestyle. Mm. Um, so I found that, that sort of encounter with bigger people and a bigger church world uh, certainly stretched me and, and enthused me for many years, to be honest with you. Mm, it's great. It's great. And then um, what's been your biggest challenge in leadership so far? Can you tell us that story? Yeah, look, I, I think over 30, uh, 34 years now, 35 years past, there's been a few. I, I would say probably, uh, again, this is about 20 years ago, I went through a 15-month period of very deep depression, uh, a relationship with a key mentor, key leader in my life um, broke down um, and, and was quite damaging. Uh, we, I think we were damaging to each other, to be honest, and also had a negative impact on some key people in my life and really plunged me into a dark, dark time for over a year. Uh, and I, I found it very difficult. Um, and I have told the story publicly that at times during that year, I, I, I was suicidal. I thought it'd be easier to end my life than to continue my life. Um, even as a Christian leader, those thoughts were within me of, you know what, this is too hard. This is too difficult. Um, and I, I probably the big lesson out of that for me is that I, I decided, Errol, just to keep plotting with God, that I would keep praying, keep reading the scriptures, keep turning up, keep doing what I needed to do, even when I felt terrible, didn't want to do anything, um, that plotting with God and the support of my wife and key friends around my world got me through. But um, never want to go back to that darkness, but certainly learn a massive lesson out of that, that um, if you plot with God, if you stay the course, if you persevere, um, there, there will come change. There will come breakthrough. It won't last uh, forever. Mm. But, um, yeah, I think that was my biggest challenge over the 30, 35 years of pastoring. Mm. I'm wondering, you know, what are some of the lessons that you've learned from transition in the sense of um, transitioning? So that experience you described, the going to the bigger churches and, uh, and, and sort yeah. of recognizing that, Hey, there's a there's a different way to doing things, and then making those changes yeah. you talked about in your speaking, your the way you dress and, yeah. and things of that nature. Um, yeah. What what some of those lessons that you learned in that transition about about transition? Because I think others yeah, listening in the same place. You know. Yeah, great question. I, the picture I love uh, most about uh, transition times, and we led our church five years ago through a transition of leadership to a new generation leader, which has gone very very successfully. Um, is I like the concept of um, unfreeze, reshape and refreeze. And the idea is a, an ice block, you take it out of the freezer mm -hmm. and you warm it up and you can just let it sit in a room and it'll, it'll kind of warm up gradually, you can microwave it, but it, it goes down from a solid form into a fluid form. Mm -hmm. Then you pour it into a different shape and then you put it back into the freezer to refreeze in a different shape. So I think whenever you want to make change in your church and your, or in your own life, you really have to 
warm people up to that change as you would warm up an ice block. You have to unfreeze people where they are. Mm. And that, that takes time. That takes a journey. When I came back from Sydney on that trip, I didn't try to change a million things in our church. I gradually warmed our church up to a new way of doing things, a new way of looking at things. And I think you can gradually warm a church up, mm. begin to reshape it with new styles, with new policies, with new processes, with new programs. Mm. And you, you begin to kind of bring in that change point when people are more fluid, as it were, rather than when they're in a set shape. And then you, you set that in concrete. You, you kind of put it back in the freezer and you set that in place. And eventually, Errol, the new thing becomes the old thing. It becomes... Hey, that was brand new a few years ago, but actually that's just the way we do things around here now. Um, but you have to be, I think as Jesus said, innocent as doves, but cunning as snakes. You do have to be shrewd uh, and wise as a leader uh, to reshape things that need changing. And um, sometimes young leaders want to smash it up. But if you break the ice block, um, you kind of will, you'll get fragments everywhere. If you melt it, you can keep all of the water. So how will that relate to somebody who's maybe they're um, they're in a church and um, you know they they're thinking of moving on from a church into a, a new place? Um, yeah. How does that analogy yeah. um, relate? Do you think? Yeah, de- definitely. I, I think if you've been a long term leader uh, of a church um, or maybe a team pastor, then I, I don't think you want to do that really quickly. If you've been a long-term leader, people have deep connections um, with you over many years as a leader. I don't think you get up and announce, you know, thanks for having me, folks. Next month I won't be here. Um, Have a great future. And uh, I've got a couple of elders here. They're going to work out who the new pastor is and see you later. Um, That's shattering the ice block. That's not warming it up. So I think you do have to uh, do a really good journey and a process of time, of talking to key people, key leaders, bringing people into your confidence, and then gradually bring people to the place of, you know what, there's going to be a major shift. It's going to be a few months down the track or six months or 12 months or whatever. Um, We're going to go explaining exactly why we're making this shift, why we're doing this. Now, if you've only been in a church a short time, maybe you don't need as big a lead time. But I led our church for 20 years and we did a transition process that um, overall took two years because I wanted to secure the future for the next pastor, that the church would be healthy at handover and that he would have a great platform to build for the future. So slow the process down, bring key people into the process and make sure you over-communicate all the change and why the change is going on. Mm, It's great, it's great. Are you seriously fired up about growing as a leader in business or church-based ministry? Are you feeling somewhat frustrated about not having realized your full potential in what you've been called to do? Could you do with someone to help you get some extra clarity or to be a sounding board for your plans and ideas? Great athletes have coaches, so do great leaders. The right leadership coach for you will result in an increased sense of clarity, direction, and purpose, dramatically increasing the results you achieve. If you're ready to step up, contact Errol to book a free, no obligation, introductory coaching session and see whether Errol is the right coach for you. Errol takes the lessons learned from his own leadership journey and from his extensive research to help leaders and entrepreneurs to step into their biggest challenges and rise to their next level. Email admin at erollawson.com right now to schedule your call. And at this stage in your journey now, how do you define success? Yeah, great question. Uh, yeah, success, interesting word, isn't it? Mm. For me, at this stage of my life, I'm in my, I'm in my 60s, I have grandchildren now, adult children. Success for me is uh, a family that follows Jesus and loves one another. That's, that's number one priority for me. Um, if I have a wife who is feeling fulfilled in her uh, Christian life and in her family life and her ministry life and generally in life, uh, then I know I've been successful. If I'm not successful with my wife, uh, how can I be successful elsewhere? Mm-hmm. Same with my children and grandchildren. If they're feeling loved, cared for, 
Um, they're feeling like I'm available. I'm a wise dad and granddad who's in their life and also still telling bad dad jokes to keep them laughing mm -hmm. at the same time. Then I feel to me that that's the pinnacle of success. I, I think there are other levels in terms of leadership and ministry. Um, and I think if I have to pick anything about leadership, ministry and church life, success to me is keeping your integrity intact. Mm -hmm. um, to be a man known as a man of character. A uh, man who is moral, man who has godly principles, uh, that to me would be success. And uh, everything else to me probably follows after those two main things, I think, Errol. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. And uh, John Maxwell said that the secrets to success are hidden in your daily routine. Typically yeah. speaking, typically speaking, what does your daily routine look like? Oh, sorry, let me say, yeah. let me rephrase that. What does the first 90 minutes of your day look like? Yeah. Look, um, if it's a day like today, the first 90 minutes was driving to the gym, an hour at the gym, and then drive home. <laughs> so that, that's not that I do that a few times a week, um, an hour, hour at the gym. On my non-gym days, it'll be up, have some breakfast, um, Bible, prayer, and that'll range from anything from 15 minutes to an hour. That'll be a variety, goes all over the place, that in terms of length of time. And then um, after that, I would spend the first part of my day organising my day, checking out what coaching appointments I'm, I'm having, if I'm doing any consulting that day, uh, getting ready for that. Uh, or if I don't have anything immediately on that day, um, during that morning, I'll do some writing. Um, pretty consistent blogger, um, so I tend to pump out a fair bit of work in the writing area. So I like to kind of get the day organised in that first 90 minutes after I've had um, some good food, definitely a cup of coffee, probably two in the first 90 minutes to get me going, um, Bible and prayer. Yeah, that would be my first 90 minutes generally. It's mm, good. It's good. And um, I heard you speak on one of your videos about the importance of thinking time. Um, yeah. Can you speak yeah. into that? Yeah, I'm a huge advocate. I, I probably started this habit um, too late in my life, probably about 15 years ago I started this habit, yeah, maybe a bit longer, uh, but I wish I'd started it earlier. Uh, about every five or six weeks I'll, I'll sit down um, for about an hour, sometimes it's 30 minutes, sometimes 90 minutes, and I ask myself a series of questions, and I'll do this in various places, sometimes at home, sometimes in a cafe, sometimes I'll do it when I'm travelling on an aeroplane, um, and I'll ask myself 15 to 20 questions, and they'll start with, how's my marriage? How's my relationship with my children? Um, how am I handling my friendships? So a whole bundle of relational questions, then questions about integrity and character, and, and you know, then a series of questions about what's the Lord saying to me? Um, how are my goals going with our Grow a Healthy Church ministry? Well, am I on target? How my, how's my financial world? Is my financial world where I want it to be? How can I improve it? Um, how's, how am I handling success? How am I handling failure? Um, who am I not forgiving any hurt? So it's, it's a, it's a, I, I guess it, in some ways it's a bit of an audit. And what's the power in that? I'm, sorry? What's the power in that? What's the benefit gained from that? Yeah, there's, there's interesting research about uh, the, the, the asking yourself of questions is sometimes more powerful than someone else asking you questions. Mm. So one of the ways Jesus worked with people was by asking questions. He uh, uh, asked over 300 questions in the Gospels. Mm. Um, do you love me? What do uh, people say about me? What do you say uh, about me? Um, have not I chosen you? I mean, I can just keep rattling off bundles of questions. So Jesus knew the power of a question. Now, I think there's power in asking yourself questions because then you begin to reflect and think. And when I do that, Errol, I'll have my calendar handy and I'll think, you know what, uh, how's my marriage? You know what, I really haven't taken day out for a coffee or a meal uh, in the last couple of weeks. I, I need to do that. I'm going to get that into my calendar right now. In fact, I think I'll surprise her. I'm going to buy some flowers tonight um, on the way home and I'll do something special. It tends to stimulate me to think about the really important things that are, you know, it's a Stephen Covey seven habits. They're important, but they're not urgent. Mm. 
the relational stuff won't bark at you until there is a crisis. So I'm trying to get ahead of the game, make sure that I kind of cut the crisis off of the past by sowing strongly into the key relationships in my life. So I, I find it's like an audit that, that pulls me up, that corrects me, that straightens me up, gets me back on purpose. And uh, I love doing it about every five or six weeks. Sometimes I'll do it more regularly, once a month, sometimes a bit longer, but uh, yeah, I find it a great habit, great habit. And have there been any other key habits that have contributed towards your success? Monday night um, for many years in our family has been family night. So um, all through my pastoring years, Monday night, when the kids were little, when they were teenagers, when they were adults before they got married, Monday night, nothing else existed on Monday night except family night. We'd eat together. Um, we kind of play a game together, watch a movie together, do something together, but no one was allowed to go out with anyone else on that night. I wasn't allowed to do anything else on that night. No one else had any time. And we just hung together as a family. When the kids were little, we'd throw them in the car and drive down to McDonald's and buy a little ice cream for a treat, uh, do things like that. But it was always Monday nights. And my children are now adults, got their own families, but probably it, it's a bit difficult now with my travel schedule, but at every second or third Monday night, we still get together as a family and have a meal together with the grandkids as well. Awesome. It's, a, it's a lot more bedlam now, but <laughs> the habit is still going uh, 30 plus years later. And Brilliant. It's, Brilliant. that has been a great habit. Thanks. Love that. And um, I love that too, man. That sounds, that's really, really inspiring, you know? Um, yeah. What's your biggest weakness as a leader? Yeah, yeah. I, I was um, I was thinking about this, one of the questions you sent me through to chew on. Look, I, I think, well, I, I would say when I was a younger leader, arrogance was my weakness. Um, but I, I would say, look, I'm in my 60s now, so you think I worked on a few things. So I feel that's not as a, a bigger weakness in my life as it used to be. I think it's still a trap I can uh, fall into. But Probably I would say my biggest weakness uh, now in my latter years of leadership is forgetting um, the authority that you carry as an older leader. You know you're getting older, Errol, when people start introducing you as a father in the faith. Um, <laughs> and that started happening to me a few years ago, and I thought, oh, there it goes. Um, my hair's getting grayer. I'm obviously getting older. They're starting to call me a father in the faith. But I, I found that um, as an older leader, you can actually forget the weight of authority you carry because of your experience, uh, because of your age, because of your expertise, um, because people will defer to you. And sometimes that doesn't help you because you can kind of forget, you know what, uh, people sometimes will get a bit intimidated um, because I've got some fruitfulness out of our ministry and leadership life. Um, got fruitfulness in my family life. Sometimes people get a little bit intimidated by that, and I can completely forget that, completely ignore that, and not make allowance for that. So learning to be sensitive to how people are looking at me, realizing that they're considering me, especially if I'm working with a leader who's 30 years old, they think I'm like the granddaddy of leadership. And, and it kind of like, if I forget that, um, I think I can be less helpful to them. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, definitely, yeah. And what's the biggest strength as a leader? Look, I, I'd say in the last five, ten years and the more coaching style of leadership that I've really embraced um, is probably the ability to listen. I, I do work very hard on asking questions and being quiet and listening. I, I find if you listen as a leader, uh, people will talk. Mm. When they talk, you find things out. Um, when you don't kind of replace or follow their story with your own story, which is a normal conversation um, style, I understand that. But when I'm in a, in a leadership scenario, I like to just let silence hang in the air and see what a leader says, because then I will find out more about what's in their heartbeat, who they are, what they're really concerned about, and then I can zero in on helping you. Let me help you in that area, because I, I hear you saying the same thing. Uh, repeatedly and and I think the ability to listen it's a very um, I found it a very difficult skill to master I don't think I master it well all the time but I certainly am better these days I think it's one of my strengths now mm. it's great it's great you know there's a, there's um there's a lot of um, church planting happening now globally and mm. yeah. um, there are leaders who are stepping out and pioneering 
and I'm sure you you know you're a lot of experience in that area. Um, yeah. Working with leaders in that area. What what would your advice be to a leader who maybe they're thinking of pioneering and stepping out, but they're not sure as to whether they're to pioneer or to be a part of a team yep. even that's already established and and to support that. How might they navigate that? Yeah, definitely um, sitting down with a, an experienced uh, pastor, an experienced leader, and doing some Q&A with them and, and let them help you explore what's in your heart. Uh, let them help you unpack what your passions and what your desires really are. And I think I've sat down with many young leaders over the years and I ask them, um, do you want to lead a church? Do you want to plant a church? Do you want to follow another pastor who's already started a church or there might be a, an older church that you could have an opportunity to take over? Do you want to be in a team role? What's really in you? Mm. And I find people with aspirations to pastoral leadership haven't actually sometimes really answered that question right. specifically. And they say, I just want to kind of lead and be a pastor and serve. And I say, well, what, here's the options. There's not too many of them in terms of pastoral leadership. What do you want to do? What, what specifically would you love to do? I think once I've explored that, I'd look at their options. And I think unless, they're, uh, unless they've got leadership strength, that is, you know what, I just want to, plant something and pioneer something and I'm desperate unless I do that, I, I encourage them work within a team context first. Mm. Get, get yourself knocked into shape by being around other leaders and allow uh, a, a lead pastor, a senior pastor, a pastor to lead you who will challenge you, say no to you, put you in places you don't want to be put and will shape you up ready to lead your own thing. I think I think an apprenticeship in that process, like Jesus did with the 12, is ideal preparation for church planting. Put yourself in a place where you're going to kind of get corralled in, boundaryed in, yoked in to, a, to an older bull, as it were, mm. and hold an ox. Um, really good training ground for that. Then I think if you're going to go and plant, my key advice to, to you would be do it within the context of a team mm. and do it from a sending church that will back you to the hilt, that will support you and strengthen you and make sure that you've got a pastor you can talk to regularly mm. to debrief, unpack. Don't be arrogant. Don't be proud. Don't do it by yourself. You'll only hurt yourself and you will hurt your family and you'll hurt others. And we don't want that in the kingdom. We want to see people do well, flourish mm. in all they're doing. It's great. Great advice, man. Great advice. And um, looking back at the, at the beginning of your leadership journey, uh, what, if mm -hmm. anything, was holding you back from going into leadership? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, I, I would say nothing um, mm -hmm. other than, than the timing of uh, the Lord. Um, and I was keen from a young age to become a pastor. And my pastor... Um, he really encouraged that, but he also gave me plenty of uh, work to do as, as a volunteer in our church and plenty of positions and then also promotions and demotions. He certainly put me through uh, plenty of good tests, which were great for me. Didn't enjoy all of them, Errol, to be honest, but uh, they were really good in my development for me and I look back on them with, with fondness now, not with heartache. Um, so I didn't see anything other than just the right timing which my pastor, I think, did very well, who invited me to be um, a youth pastor in our church. So I didn't feel like anything was holding me back. I think if, if anything holds back people from leadership, it tends to be fear, mm. uh, fear of failure. And I think that's why it's kind of good to get into the ministry mm. when you're younger because you <laughs> your fear of failure, I think, is less when you're younger. Mm. You've got less to lose. Uh, you tend to be a bit gung-ho and a bit fearless when you're young. Um, like my, my three-year-old grandson, who is completely fearless, wants to climb everything, mm -hmm. happy to go at everything. I think that's generally the spirit of young people, and I, I definitely would encourage that. So, yeah, I kind of feel like not, I, I felt like I had an open road into leadership, and I was probably the only one who, the only one who was going to mess it up by stumbling somewhere, and mm -hmm. by the grace of God, that didn't happen, thankfully. You, you know, um, in churches today, there's almost a... Um almost a uh how can i put it it's almost like a a notion almost that the the highest the position in in the kingdom of god is a senior pastor mm -hmm. and um yeah. if you're yeah. a teacher or a doctor or a business person 
you know, it's kind of inferior, you know. Um, yeah. How how have you in your journey? How have you kind of counselled that and inspired mm. perhaps people mm. to to understand the, the the wider breadth of kingdom um, yeah. responsibility? Yeah. yeah. Very very true, and I I think that's a damaging. Uh, kingdom mindset it's not a kingdom mindset a damaging mindset that you know to really serve the lord you have to be a pastor and then a senior pastor and not a team pastor you really made it at that level i think it's such a damaging mindset because it it dishonors the call of god mm. and it, it's also from a flat out numeric level it's madness mm. um, <laughs> because the, you know the average size of a church around the world is at 60 to 70 Depends who you read. Mm. Let's say it's 70 people. That means one in every 70 believers is going to be a pastor. So the other 69 aren't cutting it. I mean, it's just it's just foolishness in thinking. So one of the ways in our own church mm. that we have developed the mindset of, um, you know, wherever you get to serve is where God wants you and there's a call there. And it's about thinking about that church is one pillar of society, but education is another pillar. The arts are another pillar. Uh, politics and community service is uh, another pillar. The whole entertainment industry is another pillar in our society. Sports as an industry is another huge pillar in our society. I could go on. There's a whole range of different areas and streams. And I think helping people to find their role in an educational sphere for entrance, entrance in, for <laughs> interest, or it might be in a medical area, might be in an academic area, wh- wherever it is you serve, it might be in business or in the corporate world, is elevating the fact that these are stratas of, of our society established in humanity by Christ. Find your place to serve in that strata. Be the very best that you can, whether, whether it's in the medical area, whether it's in education, politics, arts, entertainment, wherever it is, serve in that area to the fullness of the call of God. God can anoint you there. God can equip you there. God can use you there. Um, business people, I love the fact that people in business have just as strong as call mm-hmm. as people who are pastoring. Different roles serve different purposes, but just as honorable and just as appropriate. Yep, mm-hmm. true, Errol. Awesome. We need to really kill that mindset that says, hey, unless you're a pastor, you don't really make it in the kingdom. Mm-hmm. It's a silly mindset, I think. And uh, thank you, John. And and who have been your most significant mentors along your leadership mm-hmm. journey so far? Tell us your top three for you, or just three. Yeah, Dr. Frank Holkren, the pastor of our church, he was my you know, spiritual father, as it were, my mentor, my coach, the one who developed me in my formative years of, of Christian living and, and in leadership. Mm. Uh, Jack Hayford, a uh, great pastor on the west coast of uh, America in Los Angeles, uh, just a wonderful man of God who I, I've never met but listened to many of his, this is back in the day of cassette tapes, listened to many of his tapes of preaching, wonderful man of God and uh, the leader of the movement, I'm in C3 Church, uh, Dr. Phil Pringle leads a brilliant church here in Australia, leads our movement, he's uh, he's just a pioneer man of faith um, that I just, he has, has had a deep influence on me over the last 25 years as well. So three great men um, that I've just learned so much from, very honourable men. Dr. Frank Holcren passed away this year, um, my pastor, but, um, yeah, just gone on to his reward. Um, but just three brilliant men I've loved learning from. It's great, it's great. And if I could just dig a little bit into those relationships real quickly, um, what's the best mm. piece of advice that you've gotten from each of those men? Mm. I'd, I'd say from from uh, Dr. Frank, Pastor Frank, uh, he was he was a, an old school pastor um, with a contemporary edge, and he would he would um, he would put into me again and again for ten years serving on his staff. John, it's all about people. Um, you might think it's about programs and events and your preaching and your skills and your gifts. He says, no, it's all about people. Mm. He taught me how to care for people, to love, to pastor people, to develop people. Mm. Big emphasis there. Mm. Um, Phil Pringle, his emphasis for me has been faith. Uh, be a man of faith. Take risks. Step out. Pioneer. Don't hold back. Don't let fear dominate. Let faith. Um, that's really Phil's life message is faith. Be a man of faith. And Jack Hayford, I would say his teaching gift, a magnificent teacher of the word of God mm. that put in me a deep desire 
to preach the word, to be a student of the word, uh, to spend hours studying. If you're going to preach, spend hours studying, preparing uh, for that most honourable task. And I think his deep love of scripture combined with uh, an eloquence and uh, one of my one of my um, other great mentors in my life said that he he thought that Dr. Jack Hayford had swallowed a dictionary. <laughs> he used words that uh, I I kind of knew those words, but never spoke those words. If you like, uh, he was he was a, he had a breadth of language that was inspiring. So I just loved his ability to be eloquent in preaching and articulate in bringing home the truth of the gospel. Mm, awesome, awesome. Thank you, thank you, John. And then. Um, What's the one thing you're most fired up about right now? Well, uh, yeah, it's great I'm on a podcast, Errol, because I'm, <laughs> I'm fired up about a podcast. I'm going to, uh, with a friend of mine, we're going to launch a Grow a Healthy Church podcast in 2017 and also uh, later in 2017, connected to that, we're going to launch a membership zone for leaders and pastors on our website. Wow. So that's really got me uh, really thinking and buzzing at the moment. I love podcasts. I listen to dozens of different podcasts on different topics. I enjoy it when I'm commuting or when I'm working out at the gym or out for a walk. I uh, love being on podcasts as well, to be honest. Um, yeah, so that's got me buzzing at the moment. So you're a successful podcaster. I hope to join uh, the ranks of uh, guys like you um, sometime in 2017. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Brilliant, man. And um, is there a book or a resource you'd recommend for a leader or entrepreneur that's listening right now? Yeah. Yeah, look, for entrepreneurs, but also for pastors, the best book I've read this year is The $100 Startup. Yeah, um, great. I can't even remember. The name. Oh, you've read it, have you? Yeah, it's, Chris it's a, What? That's it. That's the guy. Look, what a brilliant book. I, I read that this year. I've read it a couple of times, actually. Uh, I just love it. It's so practical, mm. so real, and so helpful. I'm, I'm actually teaching a diploma of business to students this year in Perth, and that's been uh, probably the standout book for those students in terms of how to launch something while you've still got a job. Keep your job, get $100 and launch uh, you know, a product, get it out there. I, I look one of the best books, and I'm, I'm actually rereading through it again, bits and pieces at the moment, just to help me with our podcast project as well. But yeah, great book, inspiring. It's great, it's great, awesome. We're almost done now. Um, tell us, yeah. how can we um, find out more about you? Tell us, you know, how any, mm. any, any resources that you want to share or website, yeah. social media? Yeah, look, um, growerhealthychurch.com is our website. Um, and on that is you'll find my blog and our courses and resources or you can go to Amazon and uh, four of my uh, five books are on Amazon. If you just search for John Finkeldy on Amazon or just Grow Healthy Church and then you can find it through there. But I've got a few books there on Amazon. But, um, yeah, come visit the blog or say hi to me. I'm all over Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Um, connect with me. Tell me you heard me on Errol's podcast and would love to connect uh, online in various ways. Awesome, awesome. Pastor John, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you, man. It's been great, Errol. Really have enjoyed being on your podcast. Well done, awesome. sir, on a on a very successful podcast. It's awesome, thank inspiring. You. Thank you, man. Thank you. Guys, go and check out Pastor John's website. Go and check out growahealthychurch.com. Share the resource with friends, fellow pastors, ministers, leaders out there. Your pastor um, could do with some of the resource, I'm sure. So uh, please do connect, guys, and, and share that information. God bless you. Thank you for listening today. Thank you again for joining us today on the Rising Generation Leadership Podcast. I pray you've been inspired, you've been lifted, you've been encouraged to take your personal leadership to the next level. We really encourage you guys to just take action, make it happen, do something, start somewhere, go out and change the world in some way, big or small. Guys, if you've enjoyed the podcast today, please share with your friends, share with your loved ones, your colleagues, someone out there you think might benefit from hearing this great content. And uh, if you want some more questions answering, you've got a question, email me, errol at errollawson.com. Or if you want a free 30 to 45 minute coaching session with myself around a leadership challenge or issue you're working on in your business, your church, or in your organization, please feel free to email me right away. We'll get you booked in. It's errol at errollawson.com. Thank you again for listening. Go to our iTunes page. Check it out. Check out the previous episodes. Give us a nice review. That would be awesome. Really appreciate if you could do that for us. 
We really appreciate you just for being here and listening. Thank you so much. God bless you and we'll see you on the next episode of The Rising Generation.